Um, but yeah, welcome to my talk. Thanks you all for joining me today, for choosing to, to come here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about subfiles for NetBSD. And my name is Elijah Sherwood. I worked on this as a grad student last year. And my advisor here is Dr. Philip Nelson. Um, and we come from Wash Western Washington University, which is in Bellingham, Washington. So just a little bit of background about me. This is my first NetBSD conference, so I've never met anybody here. Phil's the only one that I know here. So um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, so Washington State on the West Coast, not Washington, D.C. Uh, I got my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at Western Washington University and then stuck around for an extra year to get my master's degree. And my master's degree is where I worked on NetBSD with Dr. Nelson. So a little bit about this project. Uh, again, it was my master's project. And it went from October of 2022 to December of 2023. And this was, this project had already been started by a previous master's student, and so there was a little bit of stuff that was already there that we were able to, to work off of, and there was a lot that needed to be reworked from what was already there as well. Um, and again, project advisor is Dr. Phil Nelson, and he has been working with NetBSD since 1993. And this is a schedule of the next hour. So I'm going to give a little bit of background in history to subfiles and explain more of what they are. Uh, I'm going to outline the design for NetBSD subfiles that we have, and then talk about what it took to implement subfiles, do a high-level code walkthrough of what it looks like to open a subfile, what it looks like to unlink a subfile. And then I'm going to do a little demo. I have a disk on this computer that I can run on QEMU and just show you a little demo of what it looks like to interact with subfiles. And then talk about next steps, and then some questions at the end. Hopefully, there will be time for that. So getting into the background and history of, of subfiles. The first thing that I'm going to address while talking about subfiles is what subfile, how subfiles compare to extended attributes. So NetBSD 10 introduced extended attributes, and there might be some people that are questioning, well, why would we need both? What, how are they any different? Um, the NetBSD manual pages say, extended attributes allow additional metadata to be associated with vNodes representing files and directories. So basically, extended attributes allow the user to ex extend the, the attributes that are derivable from th just the inode data. So it gives you extra flags or extra, um, extra whatever that you want. And uh, there's two different namespaces for extended attributes to live in. The first one is the extended attribute namespace user, and that namespace is editable or changeable based on the user permissions that a user has. So if, if I'm user Eli, I can only edit the namespace of, these extended, of that ex extended attribute namespace if I have the right permissions to do so. But then there's also the system namespace where you have to be a uh, super user to access that one. So some more about extended attributes. Uh, they're useful for storing extra primitive attributes. They operate just using a simple key value pairing. So you have the name of your attribute, and then there's a bunch of, a bunch of data that's connected to that. And so that's, it's saved as a string. Um, so it, ju it just sa saves characters that are referenceable from the key. Um, and they're not directly able to relate files together. You would have to create your own system for that. Maybe two files have the same 
ex extended attribute key, and that will then relate them together. But there's, there's a lot of extra steps. It also is possible that you could save the raw data for something that you could call a subfile as an extended attribute. Um, but again, there's a lot of extra steps that go into actually taking that data out and turning that data into something that you want to use. Uh, Subfiles we've built to have a much diff different use case than this. So what is a subfile? A subfile is, is a file that's stored within a file. So it's not stored within, like, within the file data necessarily, but it's it's a store. It's a file that is logically stored within it. So just like a file is logically stored within a directory, we can logically store subfiles within other files. Uh, it's useful when the user needs multiple files to be linked together to make up one file. It's a more intimate relationship than just sharing a directory. And so here's some use cases that I have for us to consider. Uh, one use case could be file versions. So let's say you had a text file that periodically made copies of, of versions. It, in order to keep all of that data together, the, the, the program that's running these, that the text edit, editor program, it would be able to save the different versions underneath the main working version as subfiles in it can help keep that more compact. Um, also, there could be maybe a version of GCC that when you compile a C file, it could save the executable as a subfile or do some sort of pairing that would help keep source and executable files together. Um, and another use case is con complex attributes. So if you have a special file icon or uh, in applications, uh, there's usually a lot of extra stuff that goes into this, into an application bundle. So you can just kind of bundle things together. Subfiles and other file systems. So the first file system that has something that resembles subfiles is Apple's HFS plus file system. They've termed them fork files. And it initially started as a two fork system. There was a data fork and a resource fork. And one of the examples I found uh, online about where they use this was my source and executable file relationship. That, that was something that was frequently used, as well as the, um, the file icon example. That was also used uh, by HFS plus. And these files are accessible by a file path. And so you can, you can just look inside of a file just like you would a directory. There's no difference in the syntax for, for looking at subfiles. And another thing to note here is that HFS Plus has a separate extended attributes feature. So they saw that there was a need for both of these features, and they, uh, they saw that there are some overlaps with the use cases, but uh, it, would, it was worth their time to implement both. Microsoft also had something for NTFS that they termed alternate data streams. And these were initially added to support files coming from HF HFS. These alternate data streams can be accessed by a file path just like uh, in Apple's version, except they distinguish subfiles uh, by using this colon here instead of just using a slash. So now getting into what it took to revive subfiles for NetBSD. This project, like I mentioned, was initially started uh, a little bit before, actually in 2016, and that was by a different grad student named William Dobbins, and Phil Nelson also advised that project. And this was done for NetBSD 7.3. So uh, there was a lot that needed to be done to get what was working on 7.3 to work for uh, NetBSD current. And the 
things we inherited from that project was the design for NetBSD subfiles, the code to open and create subfiles for 7.3, and some subfile test cases for testing the open and close, uh, and then some subfile C library functions. So here is the design that we have, and that credit goes to Phil Nelson and William Dobbins. So if you don't like the design, I'm off the hook for that one, I guess. Um, but th this design is supposed to be very generalized so that it gives both users and developers flexibility on how they want to use their, their subfiles. Um, again, files stored within files, and there's three important terms that you need to know about when talking about subfiles in NetBSD. The first one is parent files, and then subdirectories, and subfiles, and I'll define those for us. So a parent file is a file that has a subdirectory, and it is the entry point into the subfile space. Subfiles don't exist without parent files. These can be regular files only, and the permission on the parent determines access to subfiles. So if you, you can think of it as a similar relationship between uh, a directory and the files within the directory. So a, a parent file and the subfiles within in that parent file, they, they follow a sim similar rule where if you don't have read permissions on the parent file, well then you can't see the subfiles. If you don't have write permissions on the parent file, then you can't add subfiles. Subdirectories. There is a one-to-one -one relationship with parent files. So one parent file has one subdirectory, and it shares the permissions with the parent file, except for the fact that you need executable on the subdirectory in order to see what's inside of it. And so you give it executable for the subdirectory as long as the parent file is readable. In most cases, this will be invisible to the user because we want to give the impression that the files are stored within, the subfiles are stored within the parent file, but really how it, how it comes down to it is there's a subdirectory attached to the parent file, and within that subdirectory is where the, the subfiles are. Um, the subdirectory will only exist if there's one subfile because we want a reliable way to know if the parent file has subfiles, a quick and reliable way. So uh, if the system sees that there is no subdirectory connected to the parent file, then it just says there's no subfiles. But if there is a subdirectory, then there has to at least be one subfile. And we need to keep that rule enforced to keep everything consistent. Um, and then there is no file path to get to the subdirectory. Subfiles. So these are entries within a subdirectory and the max link count of a subfile is one. So you can't have a file that's a subfile that's linked underneath as a subfile and then also uh, linked out into another random directory somewhere. Um, you also can't have nested directories, so you only have one, one directory level to, to ha organize your subfiles. Um, and a subfile cannot itself have subfiles, so we, we made subfiles pretty restricted on, on what, what can be done with it. Uh, and then the permissions are independent of the parent's permissions, but like I said before, you, you would need to be able to read the parent file in order to even see the subfiles in the first place. Okay, so now getting into the imp implementation. Uh, there's three requirements that we need to have to have subfiles be considered implemented. The first is you need to be able to create and open and unlink subfiles. That's kind of a baseline uh, function, functionality that you need to have implemented. 
The next thing is we would like to enforce the definitions of parent files, subdirectories, and subfiles so that the kernel and file system doesn't get confused and you don't end up creating things that are parent files but they're being treated as other weird things or subfiles that are being treated as parent files. Um, and then also we want to have pre-existing file operations accommodate for subfiles. And these are the things that are kind of the sugar on top. If you can have other things like RM, LS, uh, you know, other things like that. Um, if you can have that all working with subfiles, then that's kind of the, the extra thing on top. So there, in order to achieve these three requirements, we had to make changes to the kernel, the fast file system, and the NetBSD user land. And I'm just going to be going through what those changes were in, in order. So the first thing for the kernel is we had to implement two system calls. The first one is sys subfile open and, sys su and the second is sys subfile unlink. And those both take a file descriptor and that's the file descriptor of the parent file, the file path or just the name of the subfile that you're trying to open, and then open flags or unlink flags and then in the case of subfile open, you need a mode in case you're creating. Um, we needed to create these new system calls because just a simple sys open, that, that only takes a file path and subfiles don't have a file path, so you can't open with just that. You have to open underneath the parent file. So the parent file has to be open and then you can open underneath. Uh, we also added two new vnode flags, and this helps us achieve our goal of making sure that the definitions of subfiles and parent files and, and subdirectories are all consistent. Um, because subfile, you can only know if a sub, if a parent file has subfiles by looking at the parent's inode. That's the only way you can know for sure because if the parent file's inode has a non-zero subdirectory ID attached to it, then that's how you know that there, there are subfiles. But we added these vnode flags so that you can quickly look at the, uh, the cached vnode and see what type of operations you can do to it. Uh, also to enforce the definitions of subdirectories, we made some things off limits to them. So you can't change the root of a process to be a subdirectory. Um, you also can't CD into a subdirectory and you can't make a directory inside of a subdirectory. Um, there's also something off limits for subfiles and that's sub, sys subfile open because we don't want to be able to open open subfiles underneath a subfile. Uh, one accommodation that was not entirely necessary for implementation but just kind of the sugar on top that we we're talking about is we added uh, some extra stat mode values for uh, VN stat so that if you stat a subfile or a parent file, you can see if they are a subfile or a parent file based on what the stat mode is. And so S has SF, that means that it has a subfile, meaning it's a parent file. S is FF, means it is a subfile, and that means you're looking at a subfile. All right, and now getting into the UFS and FFS changes that were necessary. I mentioned before that we had to do, or I'll get to that next actually. Um, the, so the first thing is we, we wanted to 
ha give the user the opportunity or the ability to make subfiles off limits to file to certain file systems that they want to. So you can only create subfiles on an implementation of FFS if the FS subfiles superblock attribute is non-zero. Um, and so that just is a little extra feature for the user. Earlier I mentioned that the way that you know if a parent file has subfiles is if the subdir ID on the inode is non-zero. And so that subdir ID is just the inode number of the subdirectory, and that's how you access that subdirectory spaces through there. Um, and then there's some new file system operations that we had to build in order to access the inode, to access the data that's on the inode, and to get to actually translate that into, oh, now I have the inode of the subdirectory. I can turn that into the vnode and send that back to the kernel. Um, the first thing that we made is UFS subdir open, and you give that a parent file. It checks to see is there a sub is there a subdir ID attached to it that we can open. If there's not, is this parent file writable? Can I write to can I write a new subdirectory to that? Um, the new file system op the next new file system operation is subdir remove, and that basically does the opposite of subdir open, where it removes a subdirectory from a parent file. So it deallocates the subdirectory, and it also removes the subdir ID from the parent file inode. The last one is UFS RM subdir. That removes a file from the parent file, so it removes a subfile. Okay, so the next one here are some definition enforcements and accommodations. The first accommodation that we made was we made it so when you're opening a parent file, it does a check to see if that parent file has any subfiles, and it adds that VV has SF2 parent files. And that's our only opportunity there to actually see if a file has, has subfiles. So that was an essential step. Um, and then the last one is UFS remove. And if you are deallocating a parent file, it also will deallocate the subdirectory and all of the subfiles underneath it. And then here's some subfile.h files, or uh, library functions that we created, and that is just an extra convenience for the user. Uh, I, we also made a change to ls that allows ls to view subfiles. And to do that, ls uses F, the S, FTS uh, library and so we had to create a new function for subfile called subfile FTS that will um, basically allow the FTS library to extract subfiles. The next challenge we had to consider was yeah the next challenge that we faced was what do we do about FSCK FFS. Um, this is the file system consistency checker, um, and it checks the link counts within FFS, makes sure that they're consistent with the file tree hierarchy, and it runs this at boot sometimes, or uh, the user can run it whenever they want. 
uh, and the, introdu the introduction of subfiles breaks this checker. We had to make sure that because now subfiles have their own little space that FSCK isn't aware of, how do we let FSCK know about that space and how do we make sure that it can run appropriate checks on the subfiles? Um, and so we took some extra care making sure that we could integrate this function uh, in a non intrusive way. So Subfiles aren't actually the problem because it's, it will find that subfiles are connected to the subdirectory, so that will be fine. But subdirectories aren't really connected in a way that FSCK is used to seeing. It, FSCK CK doesn't check the inodes for subdir IDs. So we had to make sure that it will add that extra step. Um, yeah. Okay. So FSCK is split up into multiple passes. Pass one, it initializes a bunch of data structures, and for each inode, it will they'll have uh, some data that is. That is allocated. Uh, it allocates data for directories and regular files differently. Um, so when it sees a parent file, that is when it sees a file that has a non-zero subdir ID, it will say, "Okay, that's a special. That is a special file." And we want to actually go ahead and allocate the subdirectory right now, um, because when it right when it sees the parent file, that's its only opportunity to mark the subdirectory as a subdirectory. So if you you can't wait to come across a subdirectory and then be like, oh, here's a subdirectory, you have to do it once you see the parent file. So once it sees the parent file. It marks the subdirectory with F state, and what F state does, that's, that flag is usually only for files, but the combination of it being a, a directory type with F state, that combination is only defined now by that is a subdirectory. Um, and then the subdirectory is also given a parent, which is itself, just because later on it makes sure that everybody has a parent. So then for pass two, this time it goes through all the directories and it uh, increases the observed link count for all files in the directory. Um, and this is the state where subdirectories would then be disqualified because there, there is no directory that a subdirectory is inside of. So here, it now does an extra check where it it says it, it looks for the F state flag on the directory. And since that can only mean one thing now, it marks that directory as found and it doesn't it just it d doesn't have it it basically takes it out of being considered in further checks. And so it just says this is this is exactly how it's supposed to be. You don't have to look look at it any further. Okay, and then now for the three other user land commands that we worked on, newfs, uh, that works alongside the feature that we implemented for the super block, where you now have to have the subfile super block attribute in order to create subfiles. So if you're creating a file system using newfs, you add the dash capital D flag, and then that sets the fs subfiles attribute. The second one is rm. We can now use rm to remove subfiles and you do that using the dash d flag so it would be I'll 
show you an example of that later on, but the subfile name would be an argument for the dash capital D flag, and then you'll also have to include the parent name so it knows what parent you're deleting that subfile under. The last one we have is the ls one, and this one is useful for showing subfiles that are underneath parent files. And you can compare this, the way that this flag works to the recursive flag. So just like a recursive fl flag displays or lists the files for any directory it comes across, the dash D flag lists files, lists subfiles for any parent files it comes across. And then now I'm going to walk you guys through a just a high level overview of how this code is working. Um, so the first thing you have to do is you have to get a parent file and that's true um, that's true for any well I guess there there is a version of subfile open that takes the path for the the parent file and the path of the subfile but for f subfile open you need to provide the parent file descriptor already so you need to open the parent file and then here you <laughs> that's all right uh, so you have the okay well this might be hard to explain um, well if you can follow along with what I'm saying, um, okay, so there you call f subfile open, parent file descriptor, that's the name of the subfile. We're opening it for read, write, and create. That then calls sys subfile open, and it does these checks here. Is it, is it a regular file? Is it a parent file? If it's a parent file, then we don't need to create any subdirectories. But if it is a parent file, then we need to make sure that we have o create. Or if it is a parent file, we don't need to create a subdirectory. If it isn't a parent file, then we need to check was o create passed and should we now allocate a subdirectory. It now calls subdir open and there it gets the inode for the subdirectory that is attached to the parent files inode. If there's not one attached, allocate and attach one. Bring the subdirectory's vnode into memory by caching it and set the vnode pointer arg to the open subdir vnode. So now we're, we just open the subdirectory from the inode and we're passing it back to the subfile open system call. And so now we're back in f subfile open and here we open the file. Now, now we have the vnode for the subdirectory and we have the name of the file that we want to open. So we can just pass, we can reuse do open now. All we're doing is we're opening a file inside of a directory. And then that returns the, the file descriptor back. Can I pause for a second? Okay. Um, yes. Yes, so are you talking about the create flag that was passed there? So, yeah, so, th all right, that's not there anymore. But yes, th on my example, I passed the create flag. And so that's, I'm opening a subfile, but I passed the create flag to say, if, it's, if it doesn't exist, then create it for me. That's the subfile. Yeah, the directory could be there, it couldn't be, 
it could not be there. If it's not there, then you also have to create the directory as well. The kernel does that, yeah. You don't have to do that. Yeah, thanks for the question. The, the subdirectory only exists if there's at least one subfile. And we need, that's our reliable way to check to see if a file is a parent file or not. And so we have to enforce that. So I talk about unlink, unlink next. And so if you unlink the last subfile, you also have to detach and deallocate the subdirectory. Well, so here's a high level walkthrough of unlinking a subfile. So again, you can use a C library function. If you're using f subfile unlink, you need to provide the parent file descriptor and then the name of the, uh, the file that you're trying to unlink. Okay. Um, yeah, I might as well do that. Uh, I don't know why. Okay. Did you make it? Yep. Okay. So now I'm just going to walk you through what is happening when you're unlinking a subfile. Again, you'll have to obtain the parent file descriptor. If you're passing that to f subfile unlink, you pass the parent file descriptor and the name of the subfile that you're unlinking. So now what you do is you, you're, so that, that will call sys f sub file unlink, the system call there, and that will do the proper checks on it. It'll check to see, is, is, this even a sub, is this even a parent file in the first place, or am I wasting my time? And it will, once it confirms that it is a parent file, it will pass that to UFS sub dir open because now that we have the parent file confirmed, we're going to open the sub the subdirectory. Um, and once you have the subdirectory, then you use subdir remove to remove the subfile from the subdirectory. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier: is if the subdirectory is now empty, so if you delete the last subfile, you have to call ufs remove subdir to remove the subdirectory because we don't want an empty subdirectory. We want either a subdirectory to not exist or to have at least one subfile. Okay, and now I'm going back to the other computer uh, because, oh. yeah, sorry. Is it this one? Just the laptop there. Okay. It's going to have the same problem? Okay. Well. For the video, we can use any of the. We can make a video that can just pop in there. Okay. So this is a. Ver this is a uh, NetBSD. This is a a version of NetBSD that we've created that accommodates for subfiles. So I have, oops. So if I go into my BSD can in here. SDIR. So the first thing I'm going to try to do, touch parent. So I'm making a parent file. And then we haven't allowed touch to create subfiles, so I just created this thing called touch sf, and you provide the parent and then a child. And 
Now you see it says not supported, and that's because this disk doesn't support subfiles. So I have, if I back up out of here, so this is my script that I'm about to run that's going to set up a new disk for me. And you can see here, new FS, I have this dash D flag. And that's going to say, this new disk that you're creating, or the, this new file system you're creating, let subfiles be created on it. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I've mounted the new disk into test DIR. And so I'm, again, going to do touch parent touch subfile parent child. So now it worked that, that time. And I do ls-d. And so I have parent. And then underneath parent, there's the child. And so I can maybe uh, create a couple of them. Uh, touch. SF parent file one. So now underneath parent, there's child and file one. File one. Um, and then go back into super user to show you that if I now run fsck ffs. And I run this on, oh, I forgot. Why is this? Dev T0. So it, even though I have subfiles, I ran FSCK, and it didn't see that the subdirectory was detached. So that's all good. And then I can also do rm parent, so I'll just do an ls d one more time. So there's the parent, and then the parent has the two children. If I do rm parent, so that has now deleted the parent, and there's no subfiles now either. So I can rerun this, and it deleted all those files correctly as well. Um, so the next thing that I can show you, I'm going to create some more parent files. Exit out of super user. So touch parent2, touch sf child1, child2. Oh, right. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so that, oh, right. OK, so now I have all these subfiles. And there's some other tricks that we added with uh, ls as well. So you can do ls dash f dash d and dash f adds a, an extra little fi file identifier character. So parent 2 has a, a plus next to it and that indicates that it has subfiles. And then these stars here indicate that these are children files or subfiles. Now you can also do ls-l-d. And so we don't have the star here, but for the parent file, there's now a, a, a plus up here to indicate that it's a parent file. Okay. 
And so now I will show you about show you more about RM. So I told you that RM now has a flag that will allow individual subfiles to be cleared. So ls-d. So we have these subfiles. You can do rm-d parent to. Oh wait. So that we need to add the flag here. Child one. So now that's going to remove child one from parent two. And I have these kernel messages here because I was trying to debug something before this. Um, so that did delete it. Uh, and I think if I write, if I do su again, Okay, so it, it deleted that subfile properly. There, there's no problems from FSCK. Uh, the problem, though, that I am running into right now is if I do uh, rm d child to parent, and then I do parent, I think it's parent three. So ls -t. Um, So I I did all of that, but there's still an issue right now, um, which it was resolved at one point, and there's reasons why it's not working now. But if I now run fsck again, Oh, that time it liked it. Um, well, I was getting a problem earlier where it wasn't detaching the subdirectory properly, and so it was it was having trouble with that. But no problems anymore. Um, but you can see if I do so if I do ls-f again, it still sees it still thinks that parent two has a subfile because of this plus here. Uh, but if we do ls-d, there's no subfiles for it. So there, there are some, some bugs left still uh, to figure out there. But yeah, with that, that's the demo there. Okay. Okay, so some next steps for subfiles in NetBSD. There are a lot of other commands that can be changed to accommodate for subfiles, and this is just a short list of them. CP, MV, which MV, if you only move the parent file, there's no problem because you're only, you're, you're not changing anything having to do with the inode, but if you're copying, it's not going to copy uh, all the subfiles. Cat, being able to cat the information inside of a subfile would, would be cool. Or touch, or tar. Uh, there also is some more testing that needs to be done. I wasn't even able to replicate the error that I was getting earlier, so I need to figure that out more. Um, and currently, all of this is stored inside of a mercurial topic. So uh, yeah, we have, we have all of our source code on a topic there. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Uh, this is my email if anybody has any questions about subfiles or my code or anything like that. And also a link to my LinkedIn if anybody uses LinkedIn, they want to connect. Uh, but yeah, I've got about five minutes for questions. I'd love any questions. Yeah. Um, Right. I don't. I think that. I think that copy would be done in the user land. I think you would just have to create all the files in the right spots. Yeah. Um, 
question for the two microphones. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, I was wondering if you had thought about, rather than having a separate set of uh, uh, functions, um, like uh, like using a flag like the open app to right. say you know, because right. some file commands were all still like yeah. parent files is just a name or, or art or something, or it's right. Yeah, that that was actually something that we were kind of looking at after making all after we had gone through all the process of doing that. But yeah, even if you let's say you were using open at and you pass the file descriptor of the parent file, you wouldn't even need to add any extra flags because open at would see, oh, this is a parent file, so we can it's not a directory, it's a parent file. So yeah, that that is a real possibility that we might not even need these extra uh, these extra system calls, yeah. Um, I guess that runs into the problem of having just the Java generate and and the, the file itself not known. Right. And so you can use that extension to do it. So you need a proof of concept. Yeah. That that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That. I I think that that is right. Yeah. Because you're you're relying on the user to let, let's say the user accidentally passes a parent file instead of the directory uh, file descriptor and then it does a bunch of stuff that it was not expecting to be done. Yeah, that, that's a... Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned that there's room on the text to ignore inodes and have a node. Yep. Is that only best with HDH, so if you're only setting it to HD time, or can you like reassign to uh, We would have to accommodate for that on the chmod uh, command, yeah. But that that's something that can be done. I think if, if you do, if you're able to obtain the file descriptor of it, and then you you yeah you you can change it as you can reuse that that function just using the file descriptor yeah but just using chmod that it wouldn't know what what it is going on yeah that's a good question though thank you yes um, what do you find it useful i mean it's my user but like is there a single one you use or yeah it well it was definitely interesting for me and I, it was it was a learning experience for me it was my my first time uh, doing anything with NetBSD. It was Phil initially that had the the dreams in his head of having subfiles in NetBSD. So, uh, so answering the question directly, it was actually listed on a sub a NetBSD project list. Let's do subfiles, and I think that was before they started the extend, extended attribute. Mm -hmm. And so it was back in like 20, 2014 that we started this. It was on there, and we got with graduate students. I get three quarters of work out of them, <laughs> and then they quit. And then I couldn't talk. I tried to talk somebody else into doing this earlier. They said yes, and then they disappeared. And so finally, I talked Eli into it, and he did a great job of getting it worked out. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was, you know, give these kids experience and kernel development, and if it turns out to be something useful. Really great, and uh, I did tell the NetBSD core that hey, we have this code, and they went, well, we've got extended attributes in it. Why do we need that? So we'll see if it gets uh, in integrated. That's just one of those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I, I yeah. think that it was useful. That's why I said that was part of why I asked that use case was because I'm like, I'm sure I, I work on DSS, so I'm, I'm thinking about okay, how would I implement
Right, yeah, all an extended attribute does is you, there's, there's a, I, I think it's a library function that you can use that will, you're, you're not even really interacting with a file necessarily, you're just saying, yeah, you're, you're saying here's the key and there should be some data underneath this file that has to do that that is represented by this key and then it goes and fetches that for you. You're not there's no file that you're interacting with other than the file itself um, other than the, the parent file, I guess. I'm not sure what they would call that in extended attribute. Yeah. Okay. It's more like it's designed for like Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of things that, I think most things could be done in either sub using either subfiles or extended attributes. It's just there's more overhead in what, whichever one you choose. There, there's more of a streamlined way. Um, so that there's a lot of overlap in the use cases, though. Because Phil was talking about, uh, you know, you could actually store the raw data for a PNG file as an extended attribute, it would just be this, this big string that you're storing, but then you would have to go through the trouble of actually making that useful. It's not as easy as just opening a file like subfiles are. Yep. Um, that, that was on the file system level. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, I can pull that up again. Yeah, these are the file system operations. Yeah, the, uh, there was only two system calls here. Okay, well, that has been over an hour now. Um, but yeah, again, if you think of any more questions or want to connect at all, th those are my emails right there. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for your attention and thanks for the opportunity.